All right, we are here, and we're here to discuss kind of a important, not kind of important, it is really important topic. Very important. You know, specifically around whitetails, and that is thermals. I think that, um, you know, guys are constantly talking about wind, they're constantly talking about thermals, and I think that sometimes people actually get them mixed up a little bit. Yeah, they, they, they confuse them and think, like, one is the other. Right. It's completely two different things. Yeah, so before we get too far into this, let's just lay some thermal basics down, I guess, um, it's for some basic ground rules, I guess, just some basic concepts. If, you know, you're unfamiliar with the term thermal or um, you think of thermals as part of the wind, as you said, that's not the case. Thermals and wind are not the same. They're two different things. Thermals relative to deer hunting or hunting, any kind of hunting really, um, are created from the thermal radiation or radiant energy from the sun that is either heating a land mass up, heating a water mass up, or heating an air mass up, or a combination oh, of, of the three. So as that's happening, the less dense particles rise, the denser particles sink. So warm air is less dense, cooler air is more dense. So general rule of thumb around thermals are in the mornings as the air temperature starts to heat up, thermals will rise. And in the evening time, as that air cools, it will want to fall or sink. Yep. So those are the basics. Now, when you start to talk about the mixture of land masses, water masses, air masses, elevation, hills, timber, openings, like it becomes a jumbled mess. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. It's very confusing. Um, and this is, I feel pretty passionate about this topic because it took me probably until my late 20s, early 30s to really understand it in full and really in depth in different scenarios. And a lot of it was just trial and error. We've covered hill country, we've covered ag ground, and now we're gonna talk about water. Now this is something that can get a little bit uh, situational and there, we're gonna to try to cover it as uh, in depth as we can. And we'll, we'll talk about different types of bodies of water and uh, directions and everything um, concerning water here in a second. But first we'll talk about, we'll go smallest to big. So we'll talk okay. about streams, rivers, creeks, ponds, lakes. But before we dive into these different scenarios, the most important thing you need to take away from this video and how thermals react near water is land masses heat up quicker than water sources. And at some point, water touches land, correct? Yep. And where that touch happens, the land is gonna heat up quicker than the water. Yep. And that is going to affect how your thermals react. Yeah, I think the, the easiest way to get like a visual example of that is think about the spring thaw in the springtime. Uh, where you have you know a pond or a lake and the pond is covered in ice and you get around the edges or the banks of that pond or lake and the snow melt is happening so you have barren ground you're starting to see barren ground there and it's kind of muddy sometimes so you get some water seeping up and then the edges of that water that body of water the ice is actually thawed there and you start to see you know liquid water not frozen water there but yet in the middle of that body of water the ice can still be you know 10 inches thick yeah so that's yeah. the easiest way to get a visual of like land masses are going to heat up faster than water. And that is the biggest factor that you need to consider when. It's a, yeah. I mean, if you get that concept, then you're going to understand it, basically every other scenario. Land masses are going to react to radiant energy faster than water. Sure. Okay. So say uh, we're hunting in a scenario where we have a small stream of water and it is slowly flowing. It's not a, it doesn't have any rapids. It's just slowly flowing north, south. Okay. How close or how far away do you have to be for your thermals to either, how close to that stream do you have to be for your thermals to be pulled to it? Well, I, th um, the, I guess the one general rule of thumb would be the, bigger the body of water, the further away that you can get because it's impacting more air mass. Sure. So that's kind of one rule. And then also the faster that that body of water is flowing or the faster the current is also is going to allow you to get it further, further away from that. So if you have a small body of water, like a, 
a ditch, like as wide as this table, and it's doesn't have much flow to it. It's not going to probably impact thermals a bunch. Like it's going to settle in the evenings, and it's probably slowly going to settle and follow that water current, um, maybe just a couple feet above that water current, and just follow the flow of that. If you get in a scenario where you're in a a stream that you have to walk across, that's you know as wide as this room, it's twenty to thirty feet wide, and um, it has more flow to it, then you can really get start to get further away from that and um, the thermals are going to pull a lot harder. And it also depends on, like, when you talk about water, the other thing to consider is how deep that stream is. So if you ever dove into a lake, like off a bridge or off a cliff or something, the surface of that water is usually warm, and then the deeper that you get, the colder it gets. Yeah. It's, the same, it's the same thing if you're in a stream, a swamp, stagnant water, you know, uh, flowing water. The deeper that that stream is, the cooler that's going to be on the bottom. Now, when you start to get into the scenarios where you're in like rapids, because that water's moving so fast, it becomes less, less of a factor, but water depth is something to consider too. How does the depth affect, say, say you are, let's compare a deep river compared to a stream. What is the, like, how is that going to differ? Well, if you're in a, a deep river and we'd say deep, like eight feet, 10 feet, okay. that body of water, now assuming that it's, um, has again a river, so it has a little bit of flow, but it's not like white water rapid river. That water, because it's a bigger mass, is gonna take longer to heat up. Um, so in the morning time, that's still gonna remain cool. And in the mornings, if there's really any flow to it because water is not heating up as fast as um, the air or the land mass, like your thermals are gonna pull down there anyways. As opposed to getting sucked up. Yeah, I mean, you might get sucked up but you're eventually gonna end out over, if you're hunting in proximity to that water, you're gonna end up over top of that water because as you start to get sucked up, it's gonna end up being sucked over to that cold air mass above that water. And then it's almost like envision like a hallway. Mm -hmm. your, your scent cone's gonna get sucked out over there and it's just gonna follow that, basically the water corridor at a certain height above the water. So like if you can get set up um, and use a waterway, like a flowing waterway as a barrier, you almost can always dictate and know what, what your, what the thermals are going to do, even sometimes, uh, what the wind's going to do, because a lot of times in those scenarios, if there's a big enough change, your thermals are going to override the wind at, at that point in time, once you get out over into that water. Yeah. That's so what, it's really cool. Yeah. That's what I was wanting you to explain about how you can use that yeah, yeah. to your advantage, as opposed to being on a field edge or something where, you know, your thermals are going to get pulled out to the middle of the field, mm -hmm. you can use that water source to dictate where your, your scent cone's going. Oh, 100%. So in that case, if you were, say you're in ag country and we talked about ag country and being in a block of timber and that, you know, thermals being kind of pulled out in that open field and just settling in the evening times, if you have a, a, a flowing river or creek to your back, your thermals, they're going to come down, but instead of settling and staying there, you're going to get sucked downstream. So you can use it, even if the if um, depending on how fast the wind speed is and the wind direction, like you can cheat the wind with that too. So you can be in sets that would be technically wrong for you. The deer would have the wind and it'd be totally wrong for you. But it, if you're playing a creek like that in a scenario with thermals being sucked downstream, it could be right for you and right and right for the deer. It could be right for both. Yeah, river could be a little cheat code. It could be, yeah. So what if that river is not as deep? How does that change it? Well, it just goes back to the radiant energy of the sun being able to heat that water up faster. So there's going to be less pool there. You're going to, you'll have more rise. Now your thermals may, the water's still going to be cooler than the air temperature more than likely. So your thermals are still going to pull down towards that, but they're not going to be as low to the water. They're going to, they're just going to be up higher. Above it. Yeah. Okay. So. Which can be a problem when you start talking about wind speed and wind direction, because you think like, I know you've been in a scenario where you drop milkweed and you see, milkweed do something else and then like five minutes later it can become come from a totally different direction so it could be a case where you think that you're okay in a set like that you drop your milkweed and you watch it go down towards that creek or down towards that river and it starts to go down that water corridor but then if it gets far enough away from that water and starts to lift it catches it, something it could catch the wind and you know it could follow the wind yeah that's a good that's a good point to make now um, talk real quick. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but talk real quick, quick about how much flow affects the thermals, like how quickly or how slowly it's, it's, flowing. um, I think, you know, a lot of this is like, you have to, 
every body of water is going to be a little bit different. I mean, it depends on if you're on like a, a sandy bottom ditch or creek versus like a rock bottom. I mean, that's going to change it even just a little bit. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? So talk about how quickly. The flow. Yeah. Okay. Um, the general rule of thumb is the more flow that's in that stream, the faster your scent is going to be pulled away and the more likely those thermals are to drop and get closer to the water because the again like the sun the radiant energy doesn't have the, the amount of time to heat that body of water up so the faster it's flowing it's, so quickly because it's moving so fast so the faster that water is flowing the bigger thermal advantage that you, you're going to have okay yeah that's that's what i wanted you to cover there so um let's use the example of a pond and kind of compare how that how the center of that pond affects your thermals. Mm -hmm. So say you're hunting in a scenario and you have, you're using that pond as a barrier. So nothing can get downwind of you and you have your thermals and you're watching them. You're throwing your milkweed and it's in the evenings and you have a pond to your back. How are those thermals going to react to that pond? Well, with a pond or like a stagnant body of we'll call it a stagnant body of water. Yep. Um, not flowing, not flowing, but it's smaller than a lake. Yep. Cause the lake's going to be a little bit different. But there, the thermals are going to end up being almost like a, the ag scenario where the thermals are going to be pulled out to the center of that and then start to go up. You know, even in the, in the cool of the evening, as the thermals start to drop, as they start to settle, that because, because water um, is so much more stable than land, it's still going to have that radiant energy. Like it, it cools down slower and heats up slower. So you're not going to have as much settling there you might start to have some lift and depending on what the wind's doing, the wind's going to catch it and catch your scent cone and do something different. Um, but the general rule of thumb is it's going to, a stagnant body of water uh, is going to pull, you're going to pull out to the middle and then, and then start to rise. And I think that like in these cool October mornings, if you've been around water, like you get out and it's a cool morning and you see the steam and you see like the fog and everything lifting off that pond, that's, the same effect. And that's, like yeah, the, that's what your scent would be doing in that, that same scenario. Right, right. Now, you might not have complete, like, in the evening time, you're not going to have, like, full thermal lift where it's lifting straight up out of the yeah, sky. Yeah. But it's going to be out over top of that water. So that could get you in a scenario where, again, it's lifting up, lifting up, and then it could catch wind could. and get thrown a completely different way. Could, yeah, absolutely. So how does that differ from a lake, though? I don't have a ton of experience around lakes. But because that lake is, I mean, the, the body of water is so much bigger, you know, the water is going to be, it's going to heat up even slower and cool down even slower. So like you think about swimming in a pond in, in like May or June and it's kind of warm, you go j jump in a lake and it's 50 degrees, like you're, you're freezing. Very cold, yeah. So depending on what type of edge that you're hunting, I mean, obviously you're not hunting out in the middle of the lake, so you're hunting some type of edge that you're still going to have thermal pull in the mornings. You know, it's going to, your thermals are, because the air's or the water's going to be cooler cooler than the land mass, your thermals are still going to pull out and then rise as it starts to get out further away. And you're just going to have the same thing in the evening time where the thermals are almost just going to settle on that water. You're not going to have thermal lift, but you're still going to be pulled out there and settled, assuming that you're not, um, you know, hunting the backside of a ridge or something that has water up on up on top. Yeah, the, the depth of the... Uh, bank there too the, the depth of the water there is going to affect that too yes if like you're up on a shore or something where it's not very thick that's going to be a lot warmer yes than as it gets further further yeah up. so that's that's a good point like if you're on a like on a super shallow like a slough or something like that with you know almost like a swamp like stagnant water like back into a cove that is going to be so much warmer than that colder body of um that main body of water that you know your thermals are going to tend to go there and and, and rise or stay steady there. Yeah, that's a good point. So talk about, um, you you, t you mentioned a little bit there, but talk about where you are in proximity to the water, whether you're above it or below it. How does that affect your thermals? Um, as far as like, if you were in hill country, I guess, like. You had a body of water on top. Mm, okay. Well, I've never, I've never been in a, in that specific scenario, but um, like plan through it in my head in hill country, your thermals are going to fall in the evening and then rise in the morning. But the only difference there is instead of being caught, you know, from the wind coming across, uh, like on a leeward side, I 
would tend to think your thermals would be gravitated to pull towards that water, that body of water probably, um, and continue that path. That's kind of what I was playing through my head too. Like you would, your thermals would rise up to the point where the air starts to be cooler, mm -hmm. tend that way and then get to the middle of that body of water. And if it's still rising, it'll rise that way. But um, it would not just go straight up, but right. because that water temperature is cooler, yep. it'll be kind of pulled that way. So it like... Um... We talked about like that wind tunnel in in thermal country or uh, in hill country with the on the leeward side thermals rise and you have the you know the prevailing wind coming this way. You'd probably have, depending on the shape of the body of water, you'd probably have less of that. I would assume. I don't know. I've never been in a scenario like that, but I would assume that you would have a little bit less. Why would the shape matter? If you were hunting a ridge that was going north and south, and you had thermals rising on this, say you're hunting the west side, if you were timbered all the way around but you have that body of water running north and south, typically the wind is going to follow that water corridor. So you would end up with a south or north wind so that uh, thermals would come up and you'd catch the wind. It would get sucked out that body of water and you'd have the wind hmm. taking it away. If you had wind coming across, it would probably, I'm not sure what it'd do because you'd hit that opening. It would do some funky things there. Yeah, it'd probably be a swirl there. You'd probably have a couple different yeah. tumbles or barrels there, yeah. Interesting. All right, so say... We're in a hill country scenario. You're hunting the upper one third, but you have a river at the base at the bottom. How mm. are the thermals going to be affected there? Upper one third and what'd you say elevation change was? 100 foot. 100 feet. The concept's still gonna be the same. In the mornings, it's gonna rise. And then in the evenings, they're gonna fall if you're on that upper one third. Um, I think that the topography is gonna dictate or override what the um, body of water is doing, but again, like if the body, if you're next to the Mississippi, okay. then like it, the water is going to dictate it. Um, but assuming that it's a smaller body of water with only 100 feet of elevation change, then they're almost going to rise, and in the evening they're going to fall. When they fall, then, then they're going to hit that. Follow it. They're going to hit that body of water, and then your scent cone is going to end up following the flow of that stream or of that river. How does the change in elevation affect that? If you had more elevation change, would it affect it more? If you had less elevation change, would it affect it more? If you had more See. elevation change, the, you would, it would, the body of water would affect you less because you're further away from it. Okay. If you had less elevation change, you'd be closer to the body of water, which would affect it more. Sure. That's what I was, that's what I was thinking too. So say you were 50 feet from the water, you would have more of an effect from the water than you would. Potentially. Yeah. The yeah. The closer you, the closer you would get to the body of water, the more the more it would dictate what the thermals are going to do. Okay. So say you're hunting an island on a large river system. Do the thermals from the river affect scent drift more than the actual wind? I've never hunted islands. <laughs> um, without hunting it, I don't know. But I would assume because you're on a major river large system. Or, yeah, large river system. So you're on a major river system hunting a some type of big island like the island's got to be big enough to hunt so i'm guessing it's the size of a fo football field or something maybe i would say at that point the wind is probably following the flow of that river and the thermals are going to follow that so they can work together so i would say that it's yeah it's going to work in unison i would think depending i don't know on, that but i would as assume that and depending on how close you are to the river system yeah so if you're in the middle of that football field sized plot it's going to be different than if you're on the edge. oh yeah that's a good point if you're out in the middle of that um, you might have a little bit of a rise in the morning. If you were on the edge of that in the morning with the current going, you know, downstream, you're going to end up pulling towards the water. Yeah. So the further away you get from the water, the more lift you're going to have. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the basics here. So the closer you are to a water system, the more that water is going to affect your thermals. The further away you are from that water system, the less effect it's going to have. Yep. The effect that it's going to have if you are closer to it is that your thermals are going to be drawn to the water system and then they're going to react to the water. Mm -hmm. That's ba that's pretty much the basics of it. Yep. And then around the body of water, it's flow and depth. Yep. Like the, the size of the body of water, the flow, and then, you know, the depth, how fast it changes.